In this lecture we'll start talking about hyperlipidemia. So let me take you step by step through some basics, then to the journey of the lipids in the body, and at the end we'll conclude the mechanisms of the drugs used for hyperlipidemia. Hyperlipidemia, means, elevated concentration of any or all of the lipids in the blood. But lipids such as triglycerides and cholesterol esters, are insoluble in water. So how do they circulate in the blood? Lipids are transported in plasma in the core of particles, known as lipoproteins, that have a hydrophilic shell, of phospholipids, and free cholesterol. This surface layer is stabilized by one or more apolipoproteins, which also act as ligands, for cell surface receptors. Apolipoproteins, also known as apoproteins, are proteins synthesized in the liver. So we can say that lipoproteins consist of lipids and apoproteins, in different types and amounts. Lipoproteins are classified based on their density to, chylomicrons, VLDL, very low lipid lipoproteins, LDL, low lipid lipoproteins, and HDL, high lipid lipoproteins. Because lipids are lighter than proteins, particles that contain more lipids are larger in size, but have lower density. For example, chylomicrons have the lowest amount of proteins, and the highest amount of triglycerides. So it has the biggest size. While HDL has the highest amount of proteins and the lowest amount of lipids, so it has the smallest size. And very important information we should know, is that cholesterol is produced endogenously from acetyl-CoA, after a series of reactions. And the key enzyme for its synthesis is called, HMG-CoA reductase. So let's see their journey and their functions. Dietary cholesterol is absorbed in the intestine and carried along with triglycerides, phospholipids and proteins and chylomicron. Then chylomicrons circulate in the blood, delivering triglycerides to the tissues that need it for energy or storage. In muscle and adipose tissue, the capillaries possess an enzyme called lipoprotein lipase, that hydrolyzes the triglycerides to fatty acids. Then fatty acids enter the muscle cells for energy, and adipocytes for storage. Then after hydrolysis of triglycerides, the chylomicrons begin to shrink, and these remaining particles are called chylomicron remnants. Then they end up in the liver. The liver packages its cholesterol with triglycerides, into particles of very low lipid lipoproteins, VLDL. VLDL travels in bloodstream to other organs. During circulation, Muscle and adipose tissues gets fatty acids from VLDL, again through hydrolysis of their content of triglycerides, by lipoprotein lipase, turning it into intermediate density lipoprotein, IDL, which is converted through circulation to low density lipoprotein, LDL. LDL main function is to transport cholesterol to body tissues. So peripheral cells take up LDL by endocytosis using LDL receptor. Then cholesterol can be used, to maintain cell membrane integrity, and to make hormones. Then excess cholesterol is exported from the cells, and delivered to high density lipoprotein, HDL, to be returned to the liver, in a process called reverse cholesterol transport. The liver uses cholesterol to produce bile. Then bile, is secreted to the intestine, where it helps break down fats. Part of this bile is excreted in feces. And the rest is recycled back to the liver. So high levels of LDL in the blood, are associated with cholesterol plaque buildup, and cardiovascular diseases, such as heart attacks and strokes. For this reason, LDL is known as bad cholesterol. On the other hand, HDL is called good cholesterol, because it removes excess cholesterol from tissues and bloodstream. So now we can conclude the mechanisms of the drugs used for hyperlipidemia. Inhibitors of endogenous cholesterol production, they inhibit HMG-CoA reductase. Inhibitors of intestinal cholesterol absorption. Inhibitors of bile reuptake. And lowering triglyceride levels. 
There are other types and details we'll discuss in the upcoming lectures. There are five types. And type 2 is classified to two subtypes. Type 1 is called familial hyperchylomicronemia. It's obvious from its name, that this type is characterized by high amount of chylomicrons in the blood. And we know from the previous video, that chylomicrons carry a high amount of triglycerides. So this type is characterized by a massive fasting hyperchylomicronemia, even following normal dietary fat intake, resulting in greatly elevated serum triglycerides levels. This condition is caused by deficiency of the enzyme lipoprotein lipase, and this type is not associated with an increase in coronary heart disease. Type 2A, familial hypercholesterolemia. In this case, it's obvious that there is high amount of cholesterol in the blood, so what kind of lipoproteins? have the highest amount of cholesterol? The answer is LDL. So we can say that this type is characterized by an elevated LDL, with normal VLDL levels, due to a block in LDL degradation. And this results in increased serum cholesterol, but normal triglycerides levels. This condition is caused by defects in the synthesis or processing, of LDL receptors. In this condition, Isthmic heart disease is greatly accelerated. Type 2B, familial combined, or mixed, hyperlipidemia. Mixed hyperlipidemia, means that both cholesterol and triglycerides have a high amount in the blood, and that means high LDL and VLDL. So this type is similar to type 2A except that VLDL is also increased, resulting in elevated serum triglycerides as well as cholesterol levels. This type is relatively common. It is caused by overproduction of VLDL by the liver. Type 3. Familial dysbeta lipoproteinemia. This type is characterized by an increased serum concentrations of IDL, resulting in increased triglycerides and cholesterol levels. It is caused by either overproduction, or underutilization of IDL, due to mutant, apolipoprotein E. In this condition, Xantomas and accelerated vascular disease develop in patients by middle age. Type 4. Familial hypertriglyceridemia. This type is characterized by an increased levels of VLDL, whereas LDL levels are normal or decreased, resulting in normal to elevated cholesterol, and greatly elevated circulating triglycerides levels. It is caused by overproduction and or decreased removal of VLDL and triglycerides and serum. This is a relatively common disease. Patients with this disorder are frequently obese, diabetic, and hyperuricemic. Type 5. Familial mixed hypertriglyceridemia. This type is characterized by an increased serum VLDL and chylomicrons, that's why it's called mixed hypertriglyceridemia while LDL is normal or decreased. This results in elevated cholesterol, and greatly elevated triglycerides levels. This condition is caused by either increased production, or decreased clearance of VLDL and chylomicrons. Usually it is a genetic defect. This type occurs most commonly in adults, who are obese or diabetic. In this lecture we'll start discussing the anti-hyperlipidemic drugs. And they include the statins, niacin, fibrates, bile acid binding resins, a cholesterol absorption inhibitor, and omega-3 fatty acids. These agents may be used alone or in combination. And they should always be accompanied by lifestyle modifications, such as exercise and a diet low in saturated fats. In this lecture we'll talk about HMG-CoA inhibitors, or known as statins. There are seven agents in this category. Pitovastatin, Rosuvastatin, Atorvastatin, Simvastatin, Pravastatin, Lovastatin and Fluvastatin. First let's talk about their mechanism of action. 
they are competitive inhibitors of HMG-CoA reductase, which is the rate-limiting step in cholesterol synthesis, as we know from the previous video. And this leads to inhibition of de novo cholesterol synthesis. So they deplete the intracellular supply of cholesterol. Then depletion of intracellular cholesterol, causes the cell to increase the number of cell surface LDL receptors, and that promotes the uptake of LDL from the blood. So, we can say that plasma cholesterol is reduced by both, decreased cholesterol synthesis and increased LDL catabolism. These agents also decrease triglyceride levels, and may increase HDL cholesterol levels in some patients. Potency of these drugs differs. Pedovastatin, rosuvastatin and atorvastatin are the most potent LDL cholesterol-lowering statin drugs, followed by simvastatin and provastatin, and then lovastatin and fluvastatin. These drugs are effective in lowering plasma cholesterol levels in all types of hyperlipidemias. Reduction of elevated total and LDL cholesterol levels to slow progression of coronary artery disease along with diet and exercise. So reduce the risk of stroke and myocardial infarction. Side effects of these agents include elevated liver enzymes, so liver function should be evaluated before starting therapy, and if a patient has symptoms consistent with liver dysfunction. Myopathy and rhabdomyolysis, disintegration of skeletal muscles, have been rarely reported. Usually in patients with renal insufficiency, or taking drugs such as erythromycin, gemfibrozil, or niacin. So plasma creatine kinase levels should be determined in patients with muscle complaints. These agents may also increase the effect of warfarin, and they are contraindicated during pregnancy and lactation. First let's talk about the mechanism of action. Niacin strongly inhibits lipolysis in adipose tissue, which is the primary producer of circulating free fatty acids. The liver normally uses these circulating free fatty acids as a major precursor for triglyceride synthesis. So niacin causes a decrease in liver triglyceride synthesis, which is required for VLDL production. And as we know from the previous videos, LDL is derived from VLDL, so reduced VLDL production, leads to reduced LDL plasma concentrations. Niacin also increases HDL plasma concentration. Niacin lowers plasma levels of both cholesterol and triglycerides, so it is useful in the treatment of familial hyperlipidemias. It is often used in combination with other agents, to treat other severe hypercholesterolemias. The most common side effect of niacin, is niacin flush, which is an intense cutaneous flush, accompanied by an uncomfortable feeling of warmth, and itching. Since this effect is prostaglandin mediated, administration of aspirin prior to taking niacin decreases the flush. Niacin inhibits tubular secretion of uric acid, so it may lead to hyperuricemia and gout. Impaired glucose tolerance and hepatotoxicity have also been reported, so niacin should be avoided in hepatic impairment. Phenofibrate, etofibrate, bezofibrate and gemfibrozil are derivatives of fibric acid that lower serum triglycerides and increase HDL levels. First let's talk about the mechanism of action. The paroxysm and proliferator activated receptors are members of the nuclear receptor family that regulates lipid metabolism. Fibrates activate these receptors, leading to decreased triglyceride concentrations, through increased expression of lipoprotein lipase, and decreasing apolipoprotein C2 concentration. Fibrates also increase the level of HDL cholesterol, by increasing the expression of APOA1 and APOA2. They are used in the treatment of hypertriglyceridemias. 
they are useful in treating type 3 hyperlipidemias, which is known as dysbeta lipoproteinemia. The most common adverse effects are mild gastrointestinal disturbances. There is also a predisposition to form gallstones, due to increased biliary cholesterol excretion. Myositis, muscle weakness or tenderness may happen, and the risk may be increased in patients with renal insufficiency. Myopathy and rhabdomyolysis have been reported, in patients taking gemfibrozolin statins together, so the use of gemfibrozil is contraindicated with simvastatin. These agents may increase the effects of warfarin. They shouldn't be used in patients with severe hepatic or renal dysfunction, or in patients with pre-existing gallbladder disease. Cholesteramine, cholestapol, and colcivilum are anion exchange resins that bind negatively charged bile acids and bile salts in the small intestine, leading to the formation of an insoluble complex that cannot be absorbed from the intestine, so it is excreted in feces. This increased loss of bile acids causes the liver to use cholesterol to form bile acids. So this is followed by a decrease in intracellular cholesterol concentrations. And that activates an increased, hepatic uptake of cholesterol-containing LDL particles, which of course leads to a fall in plasma LDL. They are used in the treatment of type 2A and type 2B hyperlipidemias. Cholesteramine can also relieve pruritus, caused by accumulation of bile acids in patients with biliary stasis. The most common side effects are gastrointestinal disturbances, such as constipation, nausea and flatulence. Colcivilum has fewer gastrointestinal side effects than other agents. These drugs may impair the absorption of the fat-soluble vitamins, and they also interfere with the absorption of many drugs, such as digoxin, warfarin and thyroid hormone, so other drugs should be taken at least 1 to 2 hours before or four to six hours after, the bile acid binding resins. The first topic we'll discuss, is the cholesterol absorption inhibitor, which is called azetimibe. It selectively inhibits absorption of dietary and biliary cholesterol, in the small intestine, leading to a decreased delivery of intestinal cholesterol to the liver. This leads to a reduction of hepatic cholesterol stores, and an increased clearance of cholesterol from the blood. Is it my blower's LDL, by about 17%. A formulation of is it my benstatin therapy is often used, to lower LDL more effectively. It shouldn't be used for patients with moderate to severe hepatic insufficiency. The second topic we're gonna discuss, is the omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids. Icosapentaenoic acid and docosahexaenoic acid, are found in marine sources such as tuna, halibut and salmon. They inhibit VLDL and triglyceride synthesis in the liver, and they increase HDL cholesterol. Over-the-counter or prescription, fish oil capsules can be used for supplementation as it is difficult to consume enough omega-3 fatty acids from dietary sources alone. The most common side effects of omega-3 fatty acids, include gastrointestinal effects, such as abdominal pain, nausea and diarrhea, and a fishy aftertaste. That's all for this video. The next video will be the beginning of the central nervous system lectures. So subscribe and click on the bell icon to make sure you won't miss any of the upcoming videos.